Hi, this is Stephen Deer from MetroJacksonville.com, and we are joined today by attorney Christopher Wickersham uh, to kind of discuss the unfolding catastrophe that is the historic preservation of Springfield and the uh, collusion of the Code Enforcement Board with a lot of devastation and demolition. Chris Wickersham, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And uh, Chris, you're an attorney. Indeed I am. And you, how are you involved with this? I've been called worse things, but the, <laughs> that's usually what I'm called. I represent Preservation SOS, uh, which is a historic preservation group that we started in Springfield uh, about four years ago. And uh, it, it kind of grew out of a power vacuum after Spar Council collapsed uh, in, in kind of a scandal. Uh, it turns out that they had uh, partnered up with a developer uh, and were actually encouraging the demolition of historic homes uh, so that you could build fake old houses on the vacant lots. Uh, and then sell those for you know five or six times the price, which uh, unfortunately went down the toilet when the real estate market collapsed. Yeah, and you know you've been a, a contributor and a, uh, to the Metro Jacksonville board and our forums for you know at least five years. I have. <clears throat> and so you know we've kind of watched this kind of craziness that's happened in Springfield uh, unfold since 2006, 2007. Yeah, and I was an investor back in Springfield in the day. I uh, sold out you know, my last uh, couple of things probably back in 2004 or five. but even back in uh, 2002, 2003, uh, it was terrible. You'd get these random visits uh, from code enforcement. They would you know, willy-nilly condemn your properties. It was a six-month or eight-month battle to get them you know, uncondemned. It, uh, it, it just devastated the entire uh, area. And Chris, you, maybe you can refresh my memory, because I, I can't it, was it 82 that it was declared a historic district? It was, thereabouts, yes. And since 82, there were how many protected uh, structures? It was 1,600, or was it? There were, well, and yeah, there's a disagreement between Spark Council and us as to what constitutes a contributing structure. And for example, all the historic commercial buildings that were built, you know, either at the same time or, you know, within 20 years of most of the housing stock, uh, under the overlay that was drafted, uh, you know, primarily with the assistance of SPAR at that time, it excluded all of the commercial structures. Mm -hmm. And so if you're excluding commercial structures, there were 14 to 1,600, of which there have already been roughly 500 demolished, excuse me, 422 uh, have been demolished. So it's roughly a, a third of a National Historic District has been taken down since the designation was granted. So a third of the buildings, and this is a nationally designated historic district, the Springfield area is, and since the declaration of the historic district, a third of them have been demolished. Yes. And many of them uh, have been demolished by code enforcement. Some have been fire, some of them have fallen in on their own accord, some of them have been emergency demolitions, oh. but the majority of them have been through code enforcement. Yeah, the vast minority have been anything other than code enforcement, yes. So you and I were talking just before we came on camera today, and you said that from 82 until 2004, there had been 50 demolitions. There were very few. Uh, it really picked up in the early 2000s, and uh, there was, a, I think, a concerted strategy uh, between what was allegedly the Historic Preservation Group at that time and they pressured the city through their councilmen and then also directly you know, the code enforcement department to do something about it. And the solution was, uh, if it's unsightly, take it down. And they, they often will focus on what are essentially excuses. Uh, in the case of 253 East 2nd Street, uh, there was a porch gable that the support to it uh, was, was unstable. It would have cost a couple of hundred dollars to simply replace the structural support for that portion of the porch. It would have cost maybe $1,000 to $2,000 to just take the porch off the front of the house. Uh, would, would have taken you know, uh, several thousand dollars, but less than five, uh, to mothball it up to current city code. And instead, uh, despite our group asking that it be, you know, uh, simply correct the one deficiency everybody was worried about, they ended up paying $17,000 to demolish the entire structure. And, and they just took it down over the, uh, the objections of the actual landowner? Oh, yeah. She, she's a client of mine. In fact, they gave her a notice uh, that states you have X number of days to appeal it. Uh, she appealed it the, <laughs> as soon as she got the notice, but the second day after sending the notice, they demolished it. So she didn't even have the time to follow the city's own appellate process. And so, Chris, what's going on? I mean, you know, it just real speak, what in the heck is going on? And I, I, I want to lead up to the new revelations about this shocking misuse of the money that may end up costing the city $33 million maybe? Uh, we haven't been able to put a figure on it yet, but we've identified 577 demolitions uh, that appear to involve structures that were older than 50 years old uh, and that involved NSP1, NSP3, uh, or CBDG monies 
uh, all of which would have required what's called a Section 106 review. And what that is, is the city has to certify that because this is, you know, a protected district and this money is restricted in what it can be used for, uh, that you're not damaging the historic fabric by spending these uh, dollars uh, that we get from the federal government on, you know, demolishing something that should be preserved instead. And they can use the same money to preserve it. This is simply a choice the municipality in this case is making. And they've done none of the reviews. They've reported for none of it. Uh, and they've, they've knocked the houses down. And at worst, uh, not only were they not paying the bill for it, but they turn around and slap a lien that's in favor of the city of Jacksonville uh, against the landowner, even though the feds paid for the demolition you know, unknowingly because they're not doing the proper review process uh, to begin with. So how is this possible? Like, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, criticism of the director of code enforcement, uh, Kimberly Scott, uh, who apparently has unlimited power to decide to demolish houses, whether they're historic or not, and then she's executing on them with no other oversight or input. Is that? Yeah, no, that's a fair statement. She does exactly what she wants, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, Kimberly Daniels, within her district, there was one of her constituents that had approached her, had been having trouble with code enforcement. Uh, and they were arranging to try and get the woman grants and whatnot to, to clean up the property. Kim Scott not only tore it down against uh, you know, Kimberly Daniels' wishes, but when Kimberly Daniels went to the site to verify this was actually occurring because she couldn't believe it uh, after all the work that she'd put into to trying to save it and get money for the people to restore the house, uh, you know, Kim Scott threatened to have her arrested. Yeah, so... Uh, that's, a, that's a sitting city councilwoman. And Kim Scott said, I'm going to have you arrested. And so how, do, how, does, how does Kim Scott have this ability? Well, she's protected uh, by who or what, we don't necessarily know, or either that or it, it's such a mess within the administration that uh, she simply gets away with it. But uh, she appears to me uh, to have unlimited authority. And is that granted by ordinance, or is that the way that the policies have been structured, or is that just nobody is willing to say no to Kim? Kim uh... There's been a long series of ordinance changes that have allowed this to occur. And I think part of the root of the problem is that the general counsel's office within the city of Jacksonville is assigned to represent the various departments. Our general counsel's office is somewhat unique. They act like they're a private law firm. And the problem with that is that when you're representing, for example, in this case, the HPC, which is the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, and the Municipal Code Compliance Department, those two are generally uh, diametrically opposed goals. One wants to see the houses preserved, and MCCD, especially in the last 10 years, has made a decision that the way this is going to work is, you know, they're going to clean up the neighborhood by tearing everything they don't like down. And so you had the same general counsel for years and years represented both of them, the same individual person. The same actual person. Oh, yeah. yeah. So on the one side, he's representing the people that want to tear down the house, and on the other side, he's representing the people that want to save the house. And Correct. And, and so what you wound up with are these, you know, uh, compromises where you split the baby and nobody's happy. Uh, and, and one big one being the mothballing legislation. Uh, Kim Scott objected, or her department did, to you know, the language that would have uh, alleviated rolling fines upon mothballing. And what's a rolling fine? A rolling fine is when the city says, you know, your toilet doesn't work, or there's shingles missing off your roof, you have you know, X amount of days to fix it. If it's not fixed, they start assessing it you know, up to $250 a day, and I think the majority of them are probably $250 a day, fine against the property that runs in perpetuity. And so I've seen several of these where the fine balances are up to, you know, a half a million dollars on a $50,000 property. And the problem with that, obviously, is that, you know, you've permanently blackballed that property. Nobody is ever going to bother with it because uh, it makes no economic sense to come in and, and buy a $50,000 house, put $100,000 in renovations to have hopefully a $200,000 house and still have a, a half a million dollar fine balance. So absent some way to deal with that problem, and so far the city's been recalcitrant with it, uh, Robin Lum was very helpful in attempting to pass some legislation. City Councilman Robin Lum. Yes. Yeah, he's actually been a friend of preservation. Uh, but, you know, he was very uh, unable to get traction uh, and, and support at that time. Uh, I expect after the threat to arrest Kim Daniels, there might be something of a sea change on the council. So hopefully we'll see. How, how did we get here? How, how, did, how did we get to the point where de we're demolishing the historic districts? One person's making the decision. No one can appeal it and it's costing money. Well, up until about a year ago, that person was able to, I guess, interfere with uh, the passage of the legislation that would have changed it. And so at every legislative change that's occurred, she's basically increased her power. And uh, she had the same general counsel that was representing the HBC was representing her. So, I mean, at what point does anybody object to it? There was no check and balance on the way that any of this developed. And so now we unintended consequences by the city, probably not the unintended consequences of the people involved, now you have this like crazy place where a third of the historic structures have been demolished 
And come to find out through the digging of the actual paperwork, none of that money was legal to use. That's exactly correct. They've spent federal money without accounting for it, and they've not done the proper 106 reviews. Well, now what's a 106 review? Uh, that's basically the city having to analyze the uh, structure's historical value within the context of the historic fabric of the district and determine that it's not going to make some negative material impact. They have to then certify that to the federal government uh, in order to be able to use uh, the type of funding that they were using uh, for that purpose. Uh, the stated preference of the feds is to preserve historical fabric when it's possible. And so the feds want you to save the houses, and, and they, yeah. they provided money to do that. And instead, they spent it on demolishing them. And the person in charge of that is Kim Scott. Correct. Took the money meant to preserve the houses, used them to demolish them instead. That's exactly correct. And you know, now the city's position is essentially, oh, well, the two demolitions that you pointed out uh, were, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, you know, trust us. And we said, wait a second, we've identified 577. We want to see the 106 reviews or we want to see you pay the money back. And, I mean, really this boils down to a, a very simple deal. Stop knocking down historic structures in Springfield and we'll leave you alone. If not, we're going to take your money away. And uh, so far we've gotten nothing but pushback and resistance. We did complain, and now the MCC dig and the HPC uh, both have separate general counsels. So at least you've yeah. separated out so it's not the same person making the decision Correct. having to favor one or the other. Right. And the money that they've misused to demolish the houses has to be handed back. Yeah. <clears throat> and it threatens the, from, what, from the literature that I've been reading on the forums, it threatens the city's ability even to apply for the money next year when you have community block development grants that fund so much in the city, the hijinks of this one department throws into question whether or not we can get that money again. There's going to end up being scrutiny. There's not yet, because I, I expect, and I don't know this, this is you know, high postulation, but I would assume what's occurring behind the scenes is that the city went running to the local head office and is trying to you know, make good uh, and, and, and develop a, a friendly relationship or you know, smooth things over. Unfortunately, that's not the way that things really work. In Jacksonville, it is. Uh, however, the HUD office locally answers to HUD in Washington, who then answers to the Auditor General like every other portion of the federal government. And our group's prepared to go sit in the Auditor General's office in Washington until we get answers if need be. So this isn't going away at the local level. And I anticipate the city will have to refund. What the final price tab will be, uh, really nobody knows. But, you know, it, it's whatever it takes to get these wrongful demolitions stopped. So uh, the policy ends up taking money that shouldn't be used, you have a third of the properties demolished, millions of dollars of damage to the fabric of that community and to the homeowners that have lost their homes and no ability to recoup their investments, hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines assessed against the same property owners for using the Fed money improperly to demolish their homes. And now the whole thing might get hauled in front of the Feds and throw into question as to whether or not we even get the money in the first place. In fact, that's exactly what is happening. Yeah. So, successful policy all the way around. Well, it's, and it's even worse, uh, because you permanently blight the neighborhood. I mean, once you start taking these structures down and you end up with a vacant lot, and you want to have, say, a restaurant, or you want to have a you know, boutique come in, or a new family with, with kids, you know, it, it costs a certain amount of money, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, whatever the amount is, that you know, would get it minimally habitable uh, to have you know, either your business or your family you know, occupy this space. And once you tear the, the structure down, what you're really looking at now is, is new construction from scratch that's, you know, uh, low to mid six figures. And so what you've done is you've created this economic impediment to entry uh, for this neighborhood to ever come back. And, and it's really suffered because of it. If you look at what's happening in San Marco and Riverside, and, you know, all of the historic areas in town are undergoing this renaissance that is uh, almost in its entirety skipped Springfield. And the reason is because half of its vacant lots and uh, the problem continues to get worse, not better. There was definitely a lot of people committed to making it better at one time. There were, and there were a lot of misguided people that were committed to making it better, and they didn't necessarily do what I guess, in retrospect, would have been the best thing. Uh, but again, hindsight's 2020. I'm no genius. Uh, I'm simply saying that you know, ultimately, when your plan is to partner up with a developer and you know demolish uh, the existing historic houses. Uh, and have new construction replace them as a way to get rid of, you know, so-called blight, uh, then I, it, it kind of is terrible when, when the real estate market collapses. Because then you're left with, you know, 
hundreds of vacant lots, no houses, and no way to reasonably get houses on the lots. Chris, you volunteer your time for Preservation SOS, so this isn't a pay position for you. This is just passion? Correct. Yeah, I, I've never charged them a dime. Thank you so much for what you do. So, and uh, what do you think is going to be the outcome of this? Uh, hopefully, we're going to have a cessation of demolitions of historic structures. And once the city starts having to actually do the Section 106 reviews, those aren't done in a vacuum. Uh, a neighborhood group such as ours will, uh, we, by all intents, we, we intend to participate uh, in making sure that process is done fairly uh, and that the federal government is aware of what the impact on the historic fabric is before they allow their money to be spent on it. Uh, the city's response is, well, we'll just use general fund money. But their general fund money is you know, half comprised of federal money anyway, uh, or at least whatever the portion of it is. Uh, that's not going to work for them. They're still going to have to end up back at the same problem of verifying to the feds either that this had nothing to do at all with any money they received from a federal program, or B, uh, that it uh, does not impact negatively the historic fabric in that neighborhood. And I don't think they can actually do that when you're talking about tearing down 150-year-old houses uh, because, you know, there's a loose support on the porch or uh, just the reasons they cite are, are, are truly trivial. Well, it's a catastrophe. And Chris, thank you so much for your time on this, man. My pleasure. So this is um, Stephen Dare from MetroJacksonville.com. Uh, we're talking about the unfolding catastrophe uh, with code enforcement, Kimberly Scott, and a list of usual suspects. If you're following along on MetroJacksonville.com's very lively forums, uh, we expect to hear from you. Weigh in on this issue. Get involved. Sign up to Preservation SOS. Make your like, comments and your opinions and your passion known. Uh, I fully expect to hear from you, Bill Hoff. So this is Stephen Dare signing off. MetroJacksonville.com.